The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of forty days and speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, when they had come together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? But he said to them, It is not for you to know periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and as far as the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were watching, and a cloud took him up, out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, then behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upstairs room where they were staying, that is, Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these were continually devoting themselves with one mind to prayer, along with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. At this time Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters, a group of about 120 people was there together, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, as a result that field was called Hekeldama in their own language, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his residence be made desolate, and may there be none living in it, and, may another take his office. Therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barzabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all people, show which one of these two you have chosen. To occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And tongues that looked like fire appeared to them, distributing themselves, and a tongue rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues, as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. Now there were Jews residing in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. 
They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were jeering and saying, They are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the other eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, know this, and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you assume, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will have dreams. And even on my male and female servants I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And I will display wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him from the dead, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord continually before me, because he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue was overjoyed, moreover my flesh also will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. It is this Jesus whom God raised up, a fact to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, since he has been exalted at the right hand of God, and has received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, S.I.T. at my right hand, Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what are we to do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on urging them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, 
and that day there were added about three thousand souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all the believers were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all, to the extent that anyone had need. Day by day continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been unable to walk from birth was being carried, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple which is called Beautiful, in order for him to beg for charitable gifts from those entering the temple grounds. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple grounds, he began asking to receive a charitable gift. But Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, Look at us. And he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. 6 But Peter said, I do not have silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And grasping him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as being the very one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg for charitable gifts, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the portico named Solomon's, completely astonished. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this, or why are you staring at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you handed over and disowned in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the Holy and Righteous One, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers also did. But the things which God previously announced by the mouths of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouths of his holy prophets from ancient times. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your countrymen, to him ye shall listen regarding everything he says to you. And it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward, have also announced these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God ordained with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God raised up his servant for you first, and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. 
Being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in prison until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about five thousand. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power, or in what name, have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed, and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What are we to do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, Let's warn them not to speak any longer to any person in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, make your own judgment. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them, on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man on whom this miracle of healing had been performed was more than forty years old. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported everything that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices to God with one mind and said, Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the SEA, and everything that is in them. Who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David your servant, said, Why were the nations insolent, and the peoples plotting in vain? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, look at their threats, and grant it to your bondservants to speak your word with all confidence. While you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales, and lay them at the apostles' feet, 
and they would be distributed to each to the extent that any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the Apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, owned a tract of land. So he sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the Apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and kept back some of the proceeds for himself, with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias collapsed and died, and great fear came over all who heard about it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now an interval of about three hours elapsed, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for this price? And she said, Yes, for that price. Then Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she collapsed at his feet and died, and the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church, and over all who heard about these things. At the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them, however, the people held them in high esteem. And increasingly believers in the Lord, large numbers of men and women, were being added to their number. To such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by at least his shadow might fall on any of them. The people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together as well, bringing people who were sick or tormented with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. But the high priest stood up, along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public prison. But during the night an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, and leading them out, he said, Go, stand and speak to the people in the temple area the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple area about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, that is, all the senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, and they returned and reported, saying, We found the prison locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple area and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people, that they might be stoned. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest interrogated them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a cross. 
He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior, to grant repentance to Israel, and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. But when they heard this, they became infuriated and nearly decided to execute them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, be careful as to what you are about to do with these men. For, some time ago Theudas appeared, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about four hundred men joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee appeared in the days of the census and drew away some people after him, he also perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. And so in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and leave them alone, for if the source of this plan or movement is men, it will be overthrown. But if the source is God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. They followed his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day, in the temple and from house to house, they did not stop teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus as the Christ. Now at this time, as the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint developed on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Instead, brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The announcement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And they brought these men before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. The word of God kept spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders, and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away, and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said, this man does not stop speaking against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the council stared at him, and they saw his face, which was like the face of an angel. Now the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Listen to me, brothers and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Go from your country and your relatives, and come to the land which I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. 
5 But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground, and yet, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession, and to his descendants after him, even though he had no child. But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be strangers in a land that was not theirs, and they would enslave and mistreat them for four hundred years. And whatever nation to which they are enslaved I myself will judge, said God, and after that they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham fathered Isaac, and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac fathered Jacob, and Jacob, the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Yet God was with him, and rescued him from all his afflictions, and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and his entire household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was revealed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited his father Jacob and all his relatives to come to him, seventy-five people in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and he and our fathers died there. And they were brought back from there to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hammer in Shechem. But as the time of the promise which God had assured to Abraham was approaching, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt. Until another king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It was he who shrewdly took advantage of our nation and mistreated our fathers in order that they would abandon their infants in the Nile, so that they would not survive. At this time Moses was born, and he was beautiful to God. He was nurtured for three months in his father's home. And after he had been put outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. 22 Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was proficient in speaking and action. But when he was approaching the age of forty, it entered his mind to visit his countrymen, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended and took vengeance for the oppressed man by fatally striking the Egyptian. And he thought that his brothers understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. And on the following day he appeared to them as they were fighting each other, and he tried to reconcile them to peace, by saying, Men, you are brothers, why are you injuring each other? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? You do not intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he fathered two sons. After forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he was astonished at the sight, and as he approached to look more closely, the voice of the Lord came. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and did not dare to look closely. But the Lord said to him, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to rescue them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for forty years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, 
God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your countrymen. This is the one who was in the assembly in the wilderness together with the angel who spoke to him at length on Mount Sinai, and who was with our fathers, and he received living words to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, on the contrary they rejected him and turned back to Egypt in their hearts. Saying to Aaron, Make us a God who will go before us, for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol, and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to serve the heavenly lights, as it is written in the book of the prophets, You did not offer me victims and sacrifices for forty years in the wilderness, did you, house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rampha, the images which you made to worship. I also will deport you beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. Our fathers in turn received it, and they also brought it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations that God drove out from our fathers, until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight, and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the house of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is the footstool of my feet, what kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is there for my rest? Was it not my hand that made all these things? You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit, you are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the Righteous One, and you have now become betrayers and murderers of Him. You who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were infuriated, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they shouted with loud voices, and covered their ears and rushed at him with one mind. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Now Saul approved of putting Stephen to death. And on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen, and mourned loudly for him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and he would drag away men and women and put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went through places preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming the Christ to them. The crowds were paying attention with one mind to what was being said by Philip, as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed or limped on crutches were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now a man named Simon had previously been practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And all the people, from small to great, were paying attention to him, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. 
And they were paying attention to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip as he was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were being baptized. Now even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip, and as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was repeatedly amazed. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could acquire the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart will be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of unrighteousness. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So, when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem, and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get ready and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got ready and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this, He was led like a sheep to slaughter, and like a lamb that is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his justice was taken away, who will describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself, or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road they came to some water, and the eunuch asterisk said, Look! Water! What prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered that the chariot stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities, until he came to Caesarea. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and asked for letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, whether men or women, he might bring them in shackles to Jerusalem. Now as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, 
I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing, and leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer in behalf of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like fish scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed, and were saying, Is this not the one who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name, and had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were also closely watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him at night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried repeatedly to associate with the disciples, and yet they were all afraid of him, as they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had talked to him, and how he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus at Damascus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. Now when the brothers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace, as it was being built up, and as it continued in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it kept increasing. Now as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he also came down to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden for eight years, because he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you, get up and make your own bed. Immediately he got up. And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated means Dorcas, this woman was excelling in acts of kindness and charity which she did habitually. But it happened at that time that she became sick and died, and when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upstairs room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, 
do not delay in coming to us. So Peter got ready and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the room upstairs, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed in Joppa many days with a tanner named Simon. Now there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household, and made many charitable contributions to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And he looked at him intently and became terrified, and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and charitable gifts have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who Asterisk spoke to him left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier from his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he asterisk saw the sky opened up, and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And on it were all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the sky. A voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might mean, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius had asked directions to Simon's house, and they appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for, what is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. Now on the next day he got ready and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter helped him up, saying, Stand up, I, too, am just a man. As he talked with him, he entered and asterisk found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner, and yet God has shown me that I am not to call any person unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, 
For what reason did you send for me? Cornelius said, For days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining clothing. And he asterisk said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your charitable gifts have been remembered before God. Therefore send some men to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you, he is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner, by the sea. So I sent men to you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear everything that you have been commanded by the Lord. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation the one who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing that happened throughout Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he be revealed. Not to all the people, but to witnesses who had been chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people, and to testify solemnly that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify of him, that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had also been poured out on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter responded, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, the Jewish believers took issue with him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained at length to them in an orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came to where I was. And I stared at it and was thinking about it, and I saw the four-footed animals of the earth, the wild animals, the crawling creatures, and the birds of the sky. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and everything was drawn back up into the sky. And behold, at that moment three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea came up to the house where we were staying. And the Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house, and saying, Send some men to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, 
John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave them the same gift as he also gave to us after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has also granted to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, preaching the good news of the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And considerable numbers were added to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now at this time some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and indicated by the Spirit that there would definitely be a severe famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And to the extent that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And they did this, sending it with Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Now about that time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church, to do them harm. And he had James the brother of John executed with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter as well. Now these were the days of unleavened bread. When he had arrested him, he put him in prison, turning him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending only after the Passover to bring him before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made to God intensely by the church. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near Peter, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Put on your belt and strap on your sandals. And he did so. And he asterisk said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and yet he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. 10 Now when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a slave woman named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, You are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They said, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. 
But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, Report these things to James and the brothers. Then he left and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one mind they came to him, and having won over Blastus the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace, because their country was supported with grain from the king's country. On an appointed day, after putting on his royal apparel, Herod took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people repeatedly cried out, The voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned when they had fulfilled their mission to Jerusalem, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Now there were prophets and teachers at Antioch, in the church that was there, Barnabas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menin who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set Barnabas and Saul apart for me for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted, prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimas the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared at him, and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not stop making crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the synagogue officials sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up, and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he led them out from it. For a period of about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about four hundred and fifty years. After these things he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, 
I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed, before his coming, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem, and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the declarations of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no grounds for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out everything that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. That God has fulfilled this promise to those of us who are the descendants by raising Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have fathered you. As for the fact that he raised him from the dead, never again to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and faithful mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, and was buried among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore let it be known to you, brothers, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, see that the thing spoken of in the prophets does not come upon you. Look, you scoffers, and be astonished, and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people repeatedly begged to have these things spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking to them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath nearly all the city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. 45 But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul, and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you repudiate it and consider yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have appointed you as a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city, and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together, and spoke in such a way that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brothers. Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, 
who is testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be performed by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews, while others, with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers, to treat them abusively and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lycaonia, Lystra and Derb, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra a man was sitting whose feet were incapacitated. He had been disabled from his mother's womb, and had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke. Paul looked at him intently and saw that he had faith to be made well. And he said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And the man leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lycaonian language, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul, Hermes, since he was the chief speaker. Moreover, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard about it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men, of the same nature as you, preaching the gospel to you, to turn from these useless things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the SEA, and everything that is in them. In past generations he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And even by saying these things, only with difficulty did they restrain the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking that he was dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derb. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made a good number of disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they entrusted them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia and came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had a heated argument and debate with them, the brothers determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, after being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they were bringing great joy to all the brothers and sisters. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were received by the church, the apostles, and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, 
Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Since this is the case, why are you putting God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our forefathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they stopped speaking, James responded, saying, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has described how God first concerned himself about taking a people for his name from among the Gentiles. The words of the prophets agree with this, just as it is written. After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David, and I will rebuild I.T.S. ruins, and I will restore it. So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not cause trouble for those from the Gentiles who are turning to God but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols, from acts of sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has those who preach him in every city, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, with the whole church, to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas who was called Barzabas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers. And they sent this letter with them, the apostles and the brothers who are elders, to the brothers and sisters in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have confused you by their teaching, upsetting your souls. It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. That you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from acts of sexual immorality, if you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and after gathering the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brothers and sisters with a lengthy message. After they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brothers and sisters in peace to those who had sent them out. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, with many others also. After some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let's return and visit the brothers and sisters in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord, and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul was of the opinion that they should not take along with them this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Now it turned into such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas, and left after being entrusted by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now Paul also came to Derb and to Lystra. And a disciple was there, named Timothy 
the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brothers and sisters who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to leave with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the ordinances for them to follow which had been determined by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith, and were increasing in number daily. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, after being forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia was standing and pleading with him, and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately sought to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So after setting sail from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the following day to Nepolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were spending some days in this city. And on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to a riverside, where we were thinking that there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia was listening, she was a seller of purple fabrics from the city of Thyatira, and a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Now when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave woman who had a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing great profit to her masters by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us and cried out repeatedly, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation. Now she continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed, and he turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was suddenly gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men, Jews as they are, are causing our city trouble. And they are proclaiming customs that are not lawful for us to accept or to practice, since we are Romans. The crowd joined in an attack against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, thinking that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer asked for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of God to him together with all who were in his house. 
And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them, and was overjoyed, since he had become a believer in God together with his whole household. Now when day came, the chief magistrates sent their officers, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent word that you be released. So come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, After beating us in public without due process, men who are Romans, they threw us into prison, and now they are releasing us secretly. No indeed. On the contrary, let them come in person and lead us out. The officers reported these words to the chief magistrates. And they became fearful when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and pleaded with them, and when they had led them out, they repeatedly asked them to leave the city. They left the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they saw the brothers and sisters, they encouraged them and departed. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he visited them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a significant number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, and they attacked the house of Jason and were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these people were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a significant number of prominent Greek women and men, but when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brothers sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observed that the city was full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers as well were conversing with him. Some were saying, what could this scavenger of tidbits want to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, 
I also found an altar with this inscription, T.O. an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything that is in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands. Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. That they would seek God, if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his descendants. Therefore, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere are to repent. Because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to scoff, but others said, We shall hear from you again concerning this. So Paul went out from among them. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. After these events Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them. And because he was of the same trade he stayed with them, and they worked together, for they were tent makers by trade. And Paul was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood is on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshipper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians, as they listened to Paul, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul by a vision at night, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews rose up together against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. Saying, This man is inciting the people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of some crime or vicious, unscrupulous act, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about teaching and persons and your own law, see to it yourselves, I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. But they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. And yet Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. Now Paul, when he had remained many days longer, took leave of the brothers and sisters and sailed away to Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Paul first had his hair cut at Sencria, for he was keeping a vow. Nineteen they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. 
When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. But took leave of them and said, I will return to you again if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed in Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he left and passed successively through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was proficient in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was accurately speaking and teaching things about Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began speaking boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately to him. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him, and when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus, and found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, On the contrary, we have not even heard if there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, having discussions and persuading them about the kingdom of God. 9. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took the disciples away with him, and had discussions daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. But also some of the Jewish exorcists, who went from place to place, attempted to use the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had the evil spirits, saying, I order you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, doing this. But the evil spirit responded and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know of Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit, pounced on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Also many of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they added up the prices of the books and found it to be fifty thousand pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing and prevailing mightily. Now after these things were finished, Paul resolved in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And after he sent into Macedonia two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time a major disturbance occurred in regard to the way. For a man named Demetrius, 
a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing considerable business to the craftsmen. He gathered these men together with the workmen of similar trades, and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made by hands are not gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours will fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this and were filled with rage, they began shouting, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's Macedonian traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his sent word to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews had put him forward, and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk Asterisk said, Men of Ephesus, what person is there after all who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from the sky? So, since these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and to do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available, have them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events, since there is no real reason for it, and in this connection we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this he dismissed the assembly. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had encouraged them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derb, and Timothy, and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. Now these had gone on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and reached them at Troas within five days, and we stayed there for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were gathered together. And there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the window sill, sinking into a deep sleep, and as Paul kept on talking, Eutychus was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor, and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for he is still alive. When Paul had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak, and then left. They took away the boy alive, and were greatly comforted. But we went ahead to the ship and set sail for Assos, intending from there to take Paul on board, 
for that was what he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. Sailing from there, we arrived the following day opposite Chios, and the next day we crossed over to Samos, and on the following day we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to lose time in Asia, for he was hurrying, if it might be possible for him to be in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. From Miletus he sent word to Ephesus and called to himself the elders of the church. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was beneficial, and teaching you publicly and from house to house. Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that chains and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of God's grace. And now behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all people. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I entrust you to God and to the word of His grace which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands serve my own needs and the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this way you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they all began to weep aloud and embraced Paul, and repeatedly kissed him. Grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. Now when we had parted from them and had set sail, we ran a straight course to Kos, and on the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for the ship was to unload its cargo there. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and they kept telling Paul, through the Spirit, not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we boarded the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemy, and after greeting the brothers and sisters, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day we left and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. 
As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And he came to us and took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands, and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul replied, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we became quiet, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. After these days we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Nason of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to stay. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us gladly. And the following day Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard about them, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. So what is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore, do as we tell you, we have four men who have a vow upon themselves. Take them along and purify yourself together with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads, and then everyone will know that there is nothing to what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also conform, keeping the law. But regarding the Gentiles who have believed, we sent a letter, having decided that they should abstain from meat sacrificed to idols and from blood and what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took along the men, and the next day, after purifying himself together with them, he went into the temple giving notice of the completion of the days of purification, until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who instructs everyone everywhere against our people and the law and this place, and besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they thought that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then the whole city was provoked and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. While they were intent on killing him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He immediately took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to the crowd, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up and took hold of him, and ordered that he be bound with two chains, and he began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another, and when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be brought into the barracks. When Paul got to the stairs, it came about that he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of people kept following them, shouting, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he asterisk said to the commander, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the four thousand men of the assassins out into the wilderness. But Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city, and I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. 
When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear my defense which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet, and he asterisk said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. As also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brothers, and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened that as I was on my way, approaching Damascus at about noon, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told about everything that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I came into Damascus being led by the hand by those who were with me. Now a certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, and standing nearby he said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear a message from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all people of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized, and wash away your sins by calling on his name. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, that I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, Hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing nearby and approving, and watching over the cloaks of those who were killing him. And he said to me, Go. For I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a man from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered that he be brought into the barracks, saying that he was to be interrogated by flogging so that he would find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. But when they stretched him out with straps, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. The commander came and said to Paul, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship for a large sum of money. And Paul said, But I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to interrogate him immediately backed away from him and the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman, and because he had put him in chains. Now on the next day, wanting to know for certain why Paul had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble, and he brought Paul down and placed him before them. Now looking intently at the council, 
Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life with an entirely good conscience before God up to this day. But the high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law, and in violation of the law, order me to be struck? But those present said, Are you insulting God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brothers, that he is high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But Paul, perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, began crying out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dissension occurred between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. And a great uproar occurred, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and started arguing heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man, suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. And when a great dissension occurred, the commander was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, and he ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force, and bring him into the barracks. But on the following night, the Lord stood near him and said, Be courageous. For as you have testified to the truth about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome also. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and put themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than forty who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have put ourselves under an oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you, as though you were going to investigate his case more thoroughly, and as for us, we are ready to kill him before he comes near the place. But the son of Paul's sister heard about their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions to himself and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander and asterisk said, Paul the prisoner called me over to him and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand, and stepping aside, began to inquire of him privately, What is it that you have to report to me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, for more than forty of them are in hiding to ambush him, and these men have put themselves under an oath not to eat or drink until they kill him, and now they are ready and waiting for assurance from you. Then the commander let the young man go, instructing him, Tell no one that you have notified me of these things. And he called to him two of the centurions and said, Get two hundred soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea, with seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen. They were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter with the following content. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. When this man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him, after learning that he was a Roman. And wanting to ascertain the basis for the charges they were bringing against him, I brought him down to their council. And I found that he was being accused regarding questions in their law, but was not charged with anything deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. 
But on the next day they let the horsemen go on with him, and they returned to the barracks. When these horsemen had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. Now when he had read it, he also asked from what province Paul was, and when he learned that he was from Cilicia. He said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive as well, giving orders for Paul to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Now after five days the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and an attorney named Tertullus, and they brought charges against Paul to the governor. After Paul had been summoned, Tertullus began accusing him, saying to the governor, Since we have attained great peace through you, and since reforms are being carried out for this nation by your foresight. We acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. But, that I may not weary you further, I beg you to grant us a brief hearing, by your kindness. For we have found this man a public menace and one who stirs up dissensions among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And he even tried to desecrate the temple, so indeed we arrested him. By interrogating him yourself concerning all these matters, you will be able to ascertain the things of which we are accusing him. The Jews also joined in the attack, asserting that these things were so. And when the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul responded, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Since you can take note of the fact that no more than twelve days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And neither in the temple did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city itself. Nor can they prove to you the things of which they now accuse me. But I confess this to you, that in accordance with the way, which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and is written in the prophets. Having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this I also do my best to maintain a blameless conscience both before God and before other people, always. Now after several years I came to bring charitable gifts to my nation and to present offerings, in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified, without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jews from Asia, who ought to have been present before you and to have been bringing charges, if they should have anything against me. Or else have these men themselves declare what violation they discovered when I stood before the council. Other than in regard to this one declaration which I shouted while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead I am on trial before you today. But Felix, having quite accurate knowledge about the way, adjourned them, saying, When Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. He gave orders to the centurion for Paul to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom, and not to prevent any of his friends from providing for his needs. Now some days later Felix arrived with Drusilla his wife, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and responded, Go away for now, and when I have an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time he was also hoping that money would be given to him by Paul, therefore he also used to send for him quite often and talk with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul in prison. Festus, then, after arriving in the province, went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea three days later. And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, and they were pleading with Festus, requesting a concession against Paul, that he might have him brought to Jerusalem, at the same time, setting an ambush to kill him on the way. 
Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody in Caesarea, and that he himself was about to leave shortly. Therefore, he asterisk said, Have the influential men among you go there with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, have them bring charges against him. After Festus had spent no more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea, and on the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered that Paul be brought. After Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many, and serious, charges against him which they could not prove. While Paul said in his own defense, I have not done anything wrong either against the law of the Jews, or against the temple, or against Caesar. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, replied to Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. I have done nothing wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If, therefore, I am in the wrong and have committed something deserving death, I am not trying to avoid execution, but if there is nothing to the accusations which these men are bringing against me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then when Festus had conferred with his counsel, he answered, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Now when several days had passed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea, paying their respects to Festus. And while they were spending many days there, Festus presented Paul's case to the king, saying, There is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. And when I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I replied to them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any person before the accused meets his accusers face to face, and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered that the man be brought. When the accusers stood up, they did not begin bringing any charges against him of crimes that I suspected. But they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. And being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered that he be kept in custody until I sent him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he asterisk said, you shall hear him. So, on the next day when Agrippa and Bernice came amid great pomp and entered the auditorium, accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought before them. 24 and Festus asterisk said, King Agrippa, and all you gentlemen present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had committed nothing deserving death, and since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet, I have nothing definite about him to write to my lord. Therefore, I have brought him before you all and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner, not to indicate the charges against him as well. Now Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul extended his hand and proceeded to make his defense. Regarding all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate that I am about to make my defense before you today. Especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews, therefore I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my way of life since my youth, 
which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and in Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly serve God night and day. For this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God raises the dead? So I thought to myself that I had to act in strong opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem, not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, after receiving authority from the chief priests, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being put to death. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and since I was extremely enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O King, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you as a servant and a witness not only to the things in which you have seen me, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. For that reason, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. But continually proclaimed to those in Damascus first, and in Jerusalem, and then all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they are to repent and turn to God, performing deeds consistent with repentance. For these reasons some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to murder me. So, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. As to whether the Christ was to suffer, and whether, as first from the resurrection of the dead, he would proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. While Paul was stating these things in his defense, Festus Asterisk said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you insane. But Paul Asterisk said, I am not insane, most excellent Festus, on the contrary, I am speaking out with truthful and rational words. For the king knows about these matters, and I also speak to him with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you are going to persuade me to make a Christian of myself. And Paul said, I would wish to God that even in a short or long time not only you, but also all who hear me this day would become such as I myself am, except for these chains. The king stood up and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone out, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything deserving death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to turn Paul and some other prisoners over to a centurion of the Augustan cohort, named Julius. And we boarded an Adramidian ship that was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, 
and put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. From there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. When we had sailed slowly for a good many days, and with difficulty had arrived off Nidus, since the wind did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete, off Samony. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lacia. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul started admonishing them, ten saying to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. The harbor was not suitable for wintering, so the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there, if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. When a moderate south wind came up, thinking that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, closer to shore. But before very long a violent wind, called Eurekilo, rushed down from the land. And when the ship was caught in it and could not head up into the wind, we gave up and let ourselves be driven by the wind. Running under the shelter of a small island called Cauda, we were able to get the ship's boat under control only with difficulty. After they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship, and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis, they let down the sea anchor and let themselves be driven along in this way. The next day as we were being violently tossed by the storm, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was slowly abandoned. When many had lost their appetites, Paul then stood among them and said, Men, you should have followed my advice and not have set sail from Crete, and thereby spared yourselves this damage and loss. And yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night an angel of the God to whom I belong, whom I also serve, came to me. Saying, Do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has graciously granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. But when the fourteenth night came, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors began to suspect that they were approaching some land. And they took soundings and found it to be twenty fathoms, and a little farther on they took another sounding and found it to be fifteen fathoms. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and prayed for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea, on the pretense that they were going to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men remain on the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul kept encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken in nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your survival, 
for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all, and he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged and they themselves also took food. We were 276 people on the ship in all. When they had eaten enough, they began lightening the ship by throwing the wheat out into the sea. Now when day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did notice a bay with a beach, and they resolved to run the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders, and they hoisted the foresail to the wind and were heading for the beach. But they struck a reef where two seas met and ran the ship aground, and the prow stuck firmly and remained immovable, while the stern started to break up due to the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from accomplishing their intention, and commanded that those who could swim were to jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest were to follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. When they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for they kindled a fire and took us all in because of the rain that had started and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, Undoubtedly this man is a murderer, and though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, Paul shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. Now they were expecting that he was going to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now in the neighboring parts of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island, named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us warmly for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed afflicted with a recurring fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after he prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. After this happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and being cured. They also showed us many honors, and when we were about to set sail, they supplied us with everything we needed. After three months we set sail on an Alexandrian ship which had wintered at the island, and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. After we put in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there we sailed around and arrived at Regium, and a day later a south wind came up, and on the second day we came to Puteoli. There we found some brothers and sisters, and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and that is how we came to Rome. And from there the brothers and sisters, when they heard about us, came as far as the market of Appius and the three inns to meet us, and when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself, with the soldier who was guarding him. After three days Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews, and when they came together, he began saying to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was handed over to the Romans as a prisoner from Jerusalem. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there were no grounds for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, since I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, 
nor has any of the brothers come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for regarding this sect, it is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. When they had set a day for Paul, people came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus, from both the law of Moses and from the prophets, from morning until evening. Twenty-four some were being persuaded by the things said by Paul, but others would not believe. And when they disagreed with one another, they began leaving after Paul said one parting statement, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, and will not understand, and you will keep on seeing, and will not perceive. For the hearts of this people have become insensitive, and with their ears they hardly hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, they will also listen. Now Paul stayed two full years in his own rented lodging and welcomed all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching things about the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness, unhindered.